kind of groundbreaking. You feel like that when you're watching it, that you are watching something you've never seen before, and it's affecting you in a completely other way. It's such a story of longing and existential crisis and transcendence, but it's told with such great, gentle humor that it's forgiving of all our foibles. I think you're extraordinary. Why? I don't know yet. It's just obvious to me that you are. certainly very flattered. In 2005, I was on vacation and Charlie called me and said, you know, I've written this play for you that I want you to do and I'm gonna send it to you. And I assumed it was like a play, like a play play, but then I got it and realized that it was sort of this weird thing. Charlie gave me the play and it was called Theater for the New Ear. It was part of that program. There was a Coen Brothers piece and Charlie's piece originally in New York, and then they came to Los Angeles to do it, and the Coens weren't coming, so Charlie was to write another piece. And so he gave this to me and David Thewlis and Tom Noonan, and I love the piece so much. My cell phone rang out of nowhere, just and with an unrecognizable number, and I picked it up. And uh, he was like, hi, this is Charlie Kaufman. So at first I thought it was a joke. I didn't think it was Charlie, <laughs> Charlie Kaufman. And, um, and he rang and he said, I, I, this is Charlie, and I, I've written a part for you. So I was like, this is one of the best days of my life. So I thought it was a movie, then he began to explain what it was, and um, basically what it was is we were on the stage at lecterns with a script in front of us. Carter Burwell with a small orchestra was, was, was to one side of the stage, and central in the stage was a Foley artist doing all the sound effects. So the effect was really, it was a live radio play. And we rehearsed in New York, uh, for about two days, then flew to LA and performed it for just uh, two nights. And that was it. Well, Dan and I, we saw the original Anomalisa seven, eight years ago, and we loved it. And ever since then, I was trying to get a script from Charlie. And in order to get a script, I had to start a studio. I literally started this studio to get a fucking script so I could read it. Because <laughs> uh, I loved that, uh, that story, and I didn't want it to just die there, you know, this thing that no one else would ever see. It was just a masterpiece in terms of typical Kaufman engineering. I think that Anomalisa, the actual event um, at UCLA, sitting there watching the three actors and the Foley artist, that was the best thing, the best written thing I've ever seen because he absolutely used every single piece of the buffalo and to mix metaphors, he made the frame part of the painting. And he always does that, but this was 100% efficiency, and not only that, but using that Kaufman blend of talent and engineering to express something that we've all noticed for 6,000 years and have never expressed in any medium successfully. Dino and I had talked over the years about the possibility of doing something with stop motion that explored more adult ideas and adult themes and something that was more emotionally grounded. So when I read the script and I was super moved by it, it was just kind of like a dream come true. Two beautiful ladies trumps, my friend. <laughs> my goodness. Thank you so much. I'm blushing. Yes, thank you so much. I'm blushing too. I'd never seen anything like that before. You know, it's like they had such chemistry and it was just, it was beautiful what was happening. Like you could see these scenes. We recorded it in uh, chronological order, and I, I just remember laughing a lot. And you know, it was it was a, a very very intimate thing as well, because usually you don't do animations together. Uh, the animations I've done before, you, you do them in isolation and they put all the voices together later. That's what actors do, they interact and if you have them in a booth by themselves, there's a kind of a sterility, I think, to the performance. For a lot of animated movies, that's kind of what they're looking for, you know. They want the, everything to be very clean and precise and, you know, they have someone repeat a line over and over and over and over again with different intonations to try to then piece it together afterwards and it leads to a kind of a soulless quality. You know, often in animations they'll cut out everything that isn't clean, they'll cut out mouth noises and breathing and uh, we left all of that in and animated it. And I think that contributes to the feeling of these, these puppets being alive. 
we were very thrilled with the result of the recordings and the emotion and specificity of the moments between the characters. I need to be with you. I want to leave my wife. Really? And I go, that's a big decision. No, yeah. it's something I have to do. I mean, if you're interested. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's awfully sudden. I mean, I don't want to be responsible for breaking up a marriage. Charlie, I just love his writing, and I love him as a human being. And he and Duke work so beautifully together. He's also incredibly generous. He can really share the stage with Duke, you know? It's sort of like how you see your parents. I mean, they're just like a couple. I mean, they they would start to direct me, and then they would run off and talk and come back, and one of them would tell me something, and I, it was sort of like one person. There's only five of us in the room a lot of the time, and a technician in a booth. And... It was like five friends having a very good time together. And if something comes of it, well, great. But there's no one looking over our shoulders here. There's no big Hollywood producers telling us what to do. We could do what we wanted. And uh, so when left to ourselves, we did this. But even then, I, I wasn't sure what it would become. Hello. Welcome to the Fraser Lee. Hi. I'd read about this thing called the Fregoli Delusion, which inspired some thought about a direction. and. The, the Fregoli delusion is kind of a form of paranoia in which the person believes that everybody in the world is the same person in disguise. I was interested in it as a metaphor for a, a man who can't connect with other people and subsequently he tends to start hearing everybody as the same thing and it was a stylistic choice. When we see Michael arriving on the aeroplane, speaking to people at the airport and, and his taxi driver and the man at the reception of the hotel and the man who he orders room service from and the woman in his head who he's gonna call the old lover, all have the same voice, uh, which is the voice of Tom Noonan. Fuck's sake, Michael, I don't know who I am. I mean, who are you? Who's anybody? Who could answer that question? I don't... He had an enormous challenge, and he's so brilliant. I mean, he says, like, it was hard for him because on stage he could do all these different voices because you could see it was the same person in the film. He had to kind of limit his voice so that you got that it was the same person. It was not thrilling to begin with. It was like, oh, shit, I got it. You're not going to see me, and I have to sound the same, and everybody's going to think, well, he, I, he can't do voices. I don't know. I, but I got over that. But it, originally it was sort of hard. But he still plays every character so differently. Like, his, his kid is so different than the wife, who's, you know, so different than the ex-lover, so different than the hotel manager. I mean, he still created all these characters. And yes, I'm sure he limited his vocal range so that they all had a very similar sound, and yet he created completely different characters every time. Michael, you're freaking me out. I can't take being more freaked out right now. I went to Charlie once and said, Charlie, why, of all the people in the world you could use, why would you pick me? I have such a monotonous voice, and I don't really ever sound any different. And he said, no, no, I knew you could do it. But the fact was, he picked me because I sound the same all the time. Um, and so he, I'm sure he was laughing inside when I asked him that. Allow me to be the first to welcome you to Cincinnati. Sorry, I, I grabbed your hand. I'm just going, fuck you. No need more than a day for the zoo. It's just zoo sized. Touch the door to the room. If it feels hot, do not open it. I mean, originally in the original script, I remember counting it and it was like 41 or 42 different people. But then in the movie, they had to have every little voice of people having conversations and fights and discussions. And so I recorded hours and hours. What time's your plane tomorrow? Uh, yes, sir, what, what can I get you? Yeah, I'll, I'll be waiting outside Terminal 5. Could I see some identification? Final boarding for Flight 108. What, what is the special tonight? I, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of people. Well, this is all Tom. Everything's made yeah. Tom. That's right. Okay. Yes, oh, yes. Um, well, we still have one Lisa. All time, yeah, all the time. Yeah. You hear that everyone's Tom Noonan. Clearly, that's Michael's point of view, because that's how he hears oh. the world. That's You're safe now. representative of the kind of cacophonous drone of the life that he lives. We get the impression he's not a very happy man, and he's had enough, and he can't take any more. Where Jennifer comes into it, he hears someone standing out from the crowd, and this is an epiphany to him. This is, this is the most beautiful thing he could imagine, and, and we see a glimmer of hope. Keep talking. Um, I like different languages. I love French and Italian the most. The voice record process was like the easiest and most sort of immediately satisfying part of the experience because these actors are so good and, and the, the script is so good. And we, we took that enthusiasm and that passion immediately into everything else that we did. We'd started out approaching more conventional puppet designers who do stop motion puppets, and we'd always had the directive that it should be naturalistic to them. But there was a sort of difficulty in translating that, I think, because they, I mean, I can only speculate that there was a certain kind of idea about what a puppet needs to look like. So we were getting these kind of 
drawings that always seemed a little cartoony, a little elfin. So we started looking at real people. And then Duke showed us a picture of his ex-brother-in-law. I thought it was a good Michael, and so we agreed on that. And he was brought in and photographed, and then Carol, our sculptor, did a maquette of him. We wanted to build some of the character into the actual sculpt of Michael. So his sculpt is very unique in the sense that he's not like this neutral pose. He's actually sculpted to have kind of more rounded shoulders and, and his head slopes a little bit. And he's got bad posture and that's actually in the sculpt and, and in the mold and that's his starting neutral point that people start animating from. Lisa was spotted by our producer Rosa Tran at a, at a bar called Little Dom's. We're sitting there eating and I look up and I see this woman at the bar and for some reason she just looked like Lisa to me and it turns out she's an actress and she came in to pose for us. She was brought in and photographed and used as the basis for Lisa. She was changed a bit. She's very thin and Lisa, we wanted to be a less in shape person. How did it happen? I don't, um, I don't like to talk about it. In the play, that was left ambiguous as to what was physically wrong with Lisa. But once we're making it into a movie, we had to decide what her physical problem was, so I'd always imagined it as some sort of facial scar. And then it was a question of what it looks like and how severe is it. I had no idea what it was going to look like. In my imagination when I did the play, it was bigger. You know, it was more kind of glaring. But I like that it's so subtle and she's so self-conscious of it still. It's the bathroom. Air conditioning and heat controls here. We started to look for the world face. And we would find faces online that were androgynous, but they kind of just didn't fit. We wanted everybody to look the same, but not have it like overtly obvious. We didn't want it to be non-naturalistic. I don't think we wanted it to be in contrast to the way Michael and Lisa looked, but we wanted it to be able to serve as a male, a female, and a child. So that required a certain type of face, which ended up being, I think, generic. And the way that we achieved that is we photographed 30 people, actually, that were working in the studio at the time, combined all their faces in Photoshop, and ended up with this amalgamation of everybody, this combination of all the faces. And it had this sort of generic look. Great to see you. <laughs> yeah, oh, thanks. Where are they? It's, it's everybody, honey. What's it doing now, Daddy? <laughs> I don't recognize any of them. We hired three storyboard artists. They'll go through and in between all of Duke's thumbnails, and then we export that out, give it to the post, and then our editor puts a radio play together. And then he will piece the radio play with our storyboards. Maybe we could figure out... You've got to be kidding. Oh, this isn't going well. I'll just get the check then, miss. And then Jesus. the directors will sit in the room with the editor, and then they'll go through the animatic backwards and forwards and speed things up or, you know, give it some more air. And this is the first time they're really seeing the movie. From the numbered animatic, an assistant will sit and go through and then break down each of the shots and then listen to the audio and then give us a track read. That's what we use on the floor. So once we land a set and it's lit, we'll bring the animator to the stage. All the puppets are there. The director will come in, give some direction, and then we're kind of off and running. Then you've got this sort of protracted process of getting tiny incremental pieces of footage in that really don't tell you a hell of a lot other than, oh, that's a cool shot or that's a cool moment. You plug those things into the animatic as they come in, but you can't see the whole thing put together. Once you're done, you're sort of stuck with it. So you're basically saying, this is the movie. I hope it's good. It was nerve wracking. This is actually a real love. love. Hey, Ma, look, an airplane. The sun is always there, you just don't see it. Like that's an opening in the clouds. Yeah. Most stop motion stuff is a lot of hard light, which is, which is good, because you can get the lights further away kind of create a little more space that way. There's room for animators and people to move around. But we wanted, you know, like an intimate, dramatic feel. So in live action, you'd get lights nice and close to the actresses or actors when you're filming them, so they would be softly lit, nice eye lights. We wanted to take that approach, so that meant, you know, building smaller versions, key lights and backlights, and moving them really close to the puppets. It was more in the way than a lot of other stop motion films, but you know, I think it was worth it. After you see. Looking at reference photos and reference films, you know, films from the 70s and even earlier where the camera work was more slow and the frames were more composed and the characters would kind of move throughout those frames. 
I find it enormously charming that you read any book with a dictionary next to you. Because it was an adult themed movie, so we knew we wanted to, you know, put those filmmaking techniques into it where it's, you know, a more sophisticated audience will be able to get sucked into the story. Wait! Oh, it's your breakfast, Mr. Stone. As you're watching the film, hopefully you're taken away by the story of the film, but obviously now and again you're thinking, how long must that have taken <laughs> to, to do just that little, little moment? Each animator had a goal of about two seconds of animation, which is 48 individual frames of animation per day. Some hit their goal, most did not. Like when you think about the airport scene, you know, when they're on the people mover, that they had to move each puppet individually for every single motion, blink everything. Depends how many characters you have to animate, the complexity of the shot. Let's say you have 10 characters to move, then you, you could do like maybe 20 frames a day. This scene has a lot of secretaries that are all typing away as Michael walks in. Hello. I'm animating not just Michael walking through the door and talking to them, but all the background ladies just typing away. Definitely a lot to keep track of. Longer shots typically are the more complicated shots, so you're not really doing two seconds of animation a day. Maybe you're doing eight frames of animation a day. So if you're doing eight frames of animation a day on like a long shot, suddenly you're animating for many, many, many months. So, so many things happen in the, over the course of those many months. Lights burn out. The camera, just by gravity and nature and the elements, it starts to, it can start to shift and suddenly you're panning away from the action. Puppets break, um, sets shift. So there's a reason why, you know, these are like things you don't do in stop motion because it starts to unravel the process and create all these challenges. But we felt like it added something to the movie that made it worth it. You know, looking out the window and then the dawn would come up and lights would change over time. I mean, they had to like change the lighting a tiny bit. He's racking focus and doing camera moves and, you know, I, it's sort of, it's sort of hard to imagine how anybody could do that. And I mean, I make, I direct movies and I would, you would, I would have no interest in doing this. <laughs> you have a shot like a single shot that's multiple minutes long, like Michael and on, on the phone with Bella in the hotel room or something. That can take many, many months. So in stop motion, you'll break up the sets. You can shoot one angle on one stage and another on another stage. So we had to make seven hotel rooms. We had to make several hallway sets, so we were shooting the same scene on multiple stages. With our sets, it has to leave on stage for weeks, if not months at a time. With many lights lighting a stage, that stage would get hot during the day. It could get up to 80. During the summer, it could get up to 90 degrees. And at the end of the day, you turn those lights off and you go home and it, it cools off. So you have the wood of the set getting hotter and hotter and expanding throughout the day. And then for 10 hours, the lights would be off, it would cool, it would contract. So sometimes you'd walk in in the morning and you kind of look at the shot the night before and the shot in the morning, and it would look different. It would look like somebody, you know, an earthquake happened. There might be a, a slight shift or a bump or a, just the set readjusting to, uh, you know, its environment. So when that happens, uh, we'll have to like invent ways or find ways to reset it, get it back to the like, prior frame. The set would shift and we would get a car jack and, and, and slowly raise it up back into place. Yeah, there were, there were stages that were in one place jacked up and then chained down to the ground just to help get it back into position. And it's on a microscopic level of like in the small increment of, of the fluctuation that we'd have to adjust for. So it's crazy, it's very small. But you'll see it on screen if, if we let it go. The scope of puppets kind of increased as the time went on. You know, you start with wanting to have enough puppets for the stages, and then you add more stages. We started with 15 stages, and by the end of it, we had 21. Therefore, you have to make more puppets. So we started with probably 10 Michaels. We ended up having 20 of the main character. Extras were another thing that we thought we only needed, you know, maybe 50. We ended up more towards 120 extras. Also, with 1 6 scale, there's a lot of stuff in 1 6 scale, like little props and things, because Barbie's 1 6 scale and some other toys as well. So you can purchase things, and then we have to make molds of it and modify it. It's all still fabricated, but at least you have something that you can kind of work off of that's in that scale, so you don't have to like make every single thing from like scratch. One six scale is pretty standard for wanting a little bit more detail in stop motion while still having manageable set sizes. If the figure were to be any bigger, the stages and the sets would be much bigger. So 
Uh, we knew we had limitations working in this building, so we had to make sure everything that we built would eventually have to fit on these stages. You can go smaller and you just lose, you lose the ability to put nuances into your animation and your puppets. All those hallway shots, those walls would fly away. The animator would walk into the stage and animate, step away and then close the walls. So we would work with the uh, art department to figure out which walls hinge so the animator would have access. We ended up not doing ceilings practically, like uh, the basement office. That set was huge. And to put a ceiling on top of that set, like the anime would have no access whatsoever. So those shots, uh, we had to rely on our digital compositors to add in the ceiling afterwards. We had to work really closely with the art departments and the animation departments, trying to determine how best to let the animators kind of get in there and work because the whole film feels very kind of intimate, kind of claustrophobic, you know, the hallways feel claustrophobic, but a full-size person can't get in there and animate under those conditions. So our job was to help figure out which of these pieces can be digital and which have to be practical. We video recorded the voice recording sessions so that we could use it in animation for reference. So a lot of what you see Lisa doing, like with her hair and her gestures, that's Jennifer Jason Lee. I can't believe you're in our room. We came here from Akron just to hear you speak. Oh my God, please don't look at me. A lot of the animators would shoot video reference of themselves acting the shot out. And then Duke and I would also do the same thing and just we would compare the shots and you know, I like what he's doing here and I like what I'm doing there and how can we combine these things? Just use as a tool, as a guide to where and how these puppets would move. The movement is definitely based in the real world. So it's less exaggerated. There's less like cartooniness and so it's definitely referencing life. So you're not gonna use, uh, for example, the classical technique where you're gonna have a lot of anticipation movement and squish and squash, which is very bouncy for a cartoon. Um, this is very realistic. I mean, I knew Wallace and Gromit and other sort of stop motion stuff, and I, I really didn't know what they were gonna come up with. I didn't think it was gonna look anything like it did. So the fact that it looks sort of, I don't know, realistic is the word, but they seem really alive. There's something about the fact that they're puppets, but they're dealing with things that we've all felt or experienced in one form or another. And, and because they're puppets, we can project ourselves onto them in a way that you can't maybe when it's a real person. The closer you get to naturalism, the more complicated and subtle the animation has to be. And so we were exploring types of facial animation that could get the broadest range of emotional expression. So we leased a 3D printing machine and we went forward with replacement animation. This style of animation where it's split in the face and you have about 150 different brow pieces and about 150 different mouth pieces um, for all the mouth expressions. And you have smiling and you have chewing and you have yelling and you have the brows that are worried and furrowed and surprised. But a lot of times with the replacement animation, all of the facial animation is done in advance in the computer. And then those face sets are printed and then they're swapped out on the stage. You have the facial performance predetermined. We didn't want to do that because it's, we felt hard to get a sense of the full performance looking at those CG faces. It's really seeing the facial expressions under the light and being able to adjust performance and, and change things on the fly. The split face was a, uh, you know, just economically, it, it makes sense. Where we differ from other features is we left the, the seam in and I kind of look at it as, you know, we're seeing this whole movie from Michael Stone's point of view. And is that how he actually sees everyone? Because he already sees everyone as kind of a world face. Is it, is it truly a mask? I think it's a really wise artistic choice. There was some sort of question about it and resistance to it along the way from other people. But, you know, since we, we were the, the deciders, we stuck to our guns. And after we decided to, to use this technique and keep the seams, we, we started to see the value of it in a thematic way and started to incorporate the actual seams into the story. There's a, a dismantling of, of the puppets, which is obviously metaphorical in the moment that it happens. It's funny in the moment that it happens, and it's also educational in the moment that it happens in that you actually see how these puppets are working, how this stop frame animation that we've been losing our hearts to, we suddenly, the film stops for a few seconds to go like, look at that. It's also there for Michael Stone going, look at me, I'm lost, I'm, I'm coming apart. I've lost 
my identity. I'm having an emotional existential crisis. So all this, the face falling off is, is, is so representative. And that was, you know, that was always part of the idea that these puppets should be acknowledged as puppets. And I've had some people ask me, um, would it have cost just too much money to take out all the scenes? And I no, actually talking with the post department, it would have been cheaper to just erase the scene entirely than to what they did, which was actually like, sometimes the scene would be too big or it might, you know, chatter a little bit with the, the rest of the face. And so they would actually go in and, and hone the seam, but not get rid of it. So for them, it was, you know, a tougher task to doctor the seam when it needed to be than uh, that just erase it. Fuck you, Michael. Fuck off. Bella, I'm just trying to understand. You kind of knew you were going into uncharted territory because we would ask, you know, other studios like, oh, we're, we're coming up against this problem and, you know, maybe you can give us some advice. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's a problem. Good luck with that. In animation in general, particularly stop motion, where it is hands-on for every frame, there are no easy shots. Everything that could possibly go wrong did go wrong multiple times on this movie. I think it started when the gentleman delivered the 3D printer a week late. How are you going to get this off the truck? He goes, well, they told me you would have a forklift. Things would break during the scene, having a meltdown because it's taking so long. It looks weird. What's wrong with it? And we realized something had broken in the printer. we got to get the repair guy out here to fix the printer again. There are times when we couldn't pay him. We ran out of money. You guys don't have enough money for this. We lost animators. We were running out of stage space. Our puppets didn't work. The wire puppets have a tendency to break. We're out of shirts and we, we're out of fabric and we have to go hunt this down. The gentleman said he had to repossess our water machines. We were running out of time and it was raining and the roof did leak on us and we had to cover all the sets and stop animating. It was kind of mind boggling. There's some guy here and he wants to repossess some of the containers. These containers were storing all of our sets. You're not taking anything. It was a pretty stressful time. There were times it was very overwhelming. This was a real long haul, and it was very hard. So you just rolled up your sleeves, put your head down, and you get right into it. September 16th, 2005. Dear Michael, I'm sorry to see you go, but I understand. In terms of looking back on it, I'm amazed that it got made. I was in the studios with them times when, when it, they were feeling like this wasn't working. I spent two and a half years terrified that we were running headlong off of a cliff. And everything we heard during the production was it was a nightmare. It was a runaway train from the very beginning. But I'm also proud of the fact that I never made it the creative's problem. I sat in my office and I drank and I sucked my thumb <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I looked at a ledger getting longer and longer. <laughs> and I just, I just prepared my family for me moving in with them. <laughs> we didn't know if we were going to finish it. It was often felt like we might not. Although we kept pushing forward, we persisted in the face of like discouragement and depression and all sorts of other things um, that should have stopped us and I'm proud of it, and I'm just glad it exists. People told us a lot that this can't be done, and we have to scale down our expectations, everything, and it's, it's hard when almost everyone is telling you that. In 31 years of acting, it's one of the things I, I'll look back on and go, the, the things I'm very, very proud to be a part of, this is going to be in the top three, you know. The experience of working on this movie was the most emotional roller coaster of my life, but without a doubt, the, the greatest creative experience of my life. Maybe someday we'll meet again under better circumstances. Love, Lisa, and Mama Lisa. So it's actually not a depressing film, so I think we relate to it so much and hopefully smile in our understanding of what Charlie's trying to say, because he's really not uh, trying to depress us. I think I came out of it, most people do, going, that was great, you know, an alleviation of that mundanity of life, I think, by, by showing it so uh, uniquely and so with such novelty. Mm -hmm.